So yeah, I'd actually been involved in Live Bitcoin since January of last year. Airbits had decided at that point to start building our wallet, and we needed some sort of a technology stack to base our wallet upon. And we chose Live Bitcoin for a number of reasons that I'll go into throughout the course of the talk. And uh, the developer, the main guy behind Live Bitcoin's name is Amir Tikai. And uh, he's actually a homeless person. Like literally, he lives in squats in England and in Europe and codes this project in his spare time. And um, he came in Toronto and we decided we'd meet up with him just to talk shop and to talk about the project. And he said, oh, I'm in a hackathon. You want to join me? I'm like, sure, why not? What are we building? And then he told me what we were building and it blew my mind. I'm like, of course, we have to do this. So what we built there actually became Open Bazaar. Other people took it over from there and then ran with it and made it into Open Bazaar. So if you know what that is, you know what that does. And that's pretty exciting technology. And it wouldn't be possible without Live Bitcoin having existed first. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to talk a little bit about what Bit Lib Bitcoin does and, and why it exists. And then I'll kind of go through a tour, show you the different parts of Lib Bitcoin, how they fit together and to form a whole system. And then I'll do a little code example. We'll just run through some very simple code that just shows you how you might use Lib Bitcoin in a project. So uh, let's go ahead and go to the first slide here. Oh, oh, there we go. Okay, so here, here's the uh, architecture of your typical uh, Bitcoin startup company. We've met a lot of companies like this, and I have no problem with this. This is a great way to do it. You have um, your application over here, whether it's some sort of shopping service, you know, maybe you're selling gift cards for Bitcoin, you know, instant buy gift cards. Uh, maybe you're doing some sort of an escrow or, or smart contracts type of thing. Uh, maybe you're doing some sort of uh, trading, or maybe you're like something like Zapchain, where you have like a tipping platform built into your product. Whatever it is, you don't want to have to build the whole Bitcoin software stack from the ground up. You want to kind of have a jumping off point where you've got some high level access to the Bitcoin blockchain. So the typical way to do that is to use some sort of a centralized API provider. Uh, there's plenty of those. I've you know, got a nice long list here. There's more of them. Uh, but the problem is we have a decentralized trustless currency and yet you're trusting a centralized company to host your access to the blockchain. Now it's convenient, and the convenience has got its pros and cons, especially in a competitive marketplace, but is there another way? And so that's where uh, Lib Bitcoin comes in. So Lib Bitcoin server is effectively a blockchain API in a box. Like it's an open source project, you can be decentralized, you can run multiple servers that you control, or perhaps you're using other companies' servers, and it provides the API that you would build your typical application on top of. But that's not all LibBitcoin is. Uh, LibBitcoin is also a command line interface. It also is a command line interface for accessing the blockchain. So um, for instance, here's a command BX, which is the, the tool that you use to interface with this uh, command line thing. It fetch height and it gives you the current block height, which you know from this afternoon. Um, so if you're, you're some doing some sort of re research project with Bitcoin, I'm going to go explore the blockchain looking for certain patterns, or I'm going to be doing some scripting, you know, if funds come in, I'm going to automatically trigger some event or something. You can actually do that on the command line in shell script using this, uh, this, this tool. You can also use it as an offline wallet. It has everything you need to do a wallet, you know, from the command line if you felt like doing that. If you just be hardcore, and I'm going to spend my Bitcoins by typing in the actual, like, signatures and everything, and you can do that. Um, so the next slide. Uh, so it's also a full stack of software that for just doing Bitcoin stuff in general. Uh, down here at the bottom, we've got you know, LibBitcoin, sort of the, the central library, and then we've got a server side of the things that provides everything you need to build a full node server. And then you've got the client side, so if you want to do a thin client, or a lightweight wallet or something like that, we've also got that side as well. So it's kind of an all-in-one ecosystem of just Bitcoin software. So let's go ahead and... Um, so why, why, did, why does this exist? Why did somebody bother to spend a huge portion of their life, two years of their life, building this thing from, from the ground up, basically, you know, thankless, living homelessly and working on this project? The problem with Bitcoin is that we're pretty much all companies are running one piece of software, and that's the Satoshi client. Uh, it's a good piece of software. It does do the right things. But it's one piece of software. And if we have our entire ecosystem built on this one piece of software, that's a central point of failure. Uh, what if the government strong arms the, Live Bitcoin found, or the, the Bitcoin Foundation and says to them, we want you to put in this tracking stuff into the, the software and you can't distribute the software without that, or whatever, right? We don't want to have one person or one group of people control the whole fate of the entire thing, Bitcoin, that we're all using. So 
Uh, Amir's idea was that we need to create a second from the ground up implementation of the entire blockchain technology. Everything that we have from, from validating blocks, you know, checking transactions, verifying signatures, the whole thing from the ground up so that we have a second implementation so that it's no longer a monoculture. We have Lib Bitcoin and they'll have you know, the Bitcoin core and we'll have other ones that follow along in the future. A BDCD is one of those as well. Uh, so that's kind of why it exists. Uh, right now there's three major users of it and there's lots of smaller users. Uh, the big like headline user is Dark Wallet. Uh, they're uh, the private uh, anonym anonymous wallet. They have coin mixing built in. They have stealth addresses built in. They have all the, the high tech, like let's really be anonymous and disappear into the darkness kind of stuff. Um, then there's Open Bazaar, which was the hackathon project that we did. And it kind of took our legs and it ran off on its own, which is great because you know, we, we were busy with other things. So this is a marketplace, decentralized, anonymous, um, Nobody can shut it down because it's peer-to-peer, -peer, so you can post a listing on it, like an eBay listing, and someone can buy it, and it's got arbitration all built in, and it's using LibBitcoin, and no one can shut it down because you have to shut down every single LibBitcoin server in the world in order to do that. And then we've also got Airbits, which is a consumer wallet. You know, it's not quite so dark and, and uh, anonymous as a uh, dark wallet, but it's, it's almost to that level, but it's got the friendly, polished user interface that you'd expect from a consumer app. So those are the three like major users of LibBitcoin. So let's go ahead and take a tour of the different components and what they do and how they fit together and why they exist. So starting here on the bottom, LibBitcoin, uh, what's in there is, um, is uh, it's a modern C++ 11, so it's actually C++, so if you don't like doing C++, you probably don't make use of LibBitcoin. It's designed to be a collection of modules. So if you want to deal with Bitcoin addresses or, or elliptic curve cryptography, then you've got all that stuff. If you want to deal with the blockchain and validating blocks or checking signatures, you've got all that stuff. Everything is kind of uh, di disconnected from each other, so you can use one part without bringing in all the rest. So it's all uh, very orthogonal, very modular uh, as a, just a base collection of utilities. Um, uh, it's got the basic blockchain types, the things you'd expect to find on the blockchain, transactions, uh, signatures, uh, scripts, the crypto primitives, elliptic curve uh, signatures and things like that. Um, it's got wallets. So wallet stuff, not, not doesn't actually have a wallet built into it. It just has the stuff you'd use in a wallet. So addresses, um, uh, hierarchical keys, uh, you can sign messages, kind of like you have in the Satoshi client, you can take a message and sign it, all that sort of stuff. And it also has the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, node protocol, so it can talk to other peers on the Bitcoin network and get blocks and, and figure out what's going on. So that's all that sort of basic stuff that you'd use as sort of the foundation of your project. Um, the next layer up is LibBitcoin blockchain. And what this is, is actually a database, custom written from scratch, specifically for holding the Bitcoin blockchain. Because the Bitcoin blockchain is an interesting data structure. Unlike a traditional database where data comes in, data goes out, things are constantly changing, you never know quite which row is going to be updated at which time. The blockchain is append only, meaning you have you know, gigabytes of data that never change, and the only changes are happening on the end when new blocks and new transactions are being added. So we actually designed a database from the ground up with that model of data storage built in so it would be super fast for that specific use case. So it's actually a brand new database uh, for that. And it's also got indexes, rich indexes. So if you want to look up transactions by their hash, or you want to look up transactions by their address, or you want to look up blocks by their height, anything you want to do, it's all indexed. So we can get that data for you right away. There's no having to search for it. It's just all indexed and right, right available. Uh, I'm just going to skip over LibBitcoin node. LibBitcoin node is basically just a node. It, it sits on the network, it connects to peers, and transfers data back and forth and does the things that a node would do. So if you just need a node for your project for whatever reason, it's just sitting there ready for you to use. Uh, LibBitcoin server is the, the part that we're going to talk about next. Uh, the server actually used to be called Obelisk. Uh, there was uh, some confusion over the name, like what is Obelisk? I keep hearing about this Obelisk thing, so we decided we'd better just call it LibBitcoin Server because that is a name that has meaning. You, know, you can see that it fits in with the LibBitcoin project and what it does. It's the server part. It's the API. So uh, if you want to talk to the blockchain, you just use that server. It's got all the calls you need. And it communicates over 0MQ. 0MQ uh, is kind of like a socket type of thing. But it's a higher level abstraction over a socket. Um, and that's used for basically just making sure the data flows smoothly from the server to the client. 
Um, so here's some of the commands that you've got inside the server, just to kind of give you a sense of what level this API is sitting at. Uh, so you can go ahead, fetch history, so given a particular address, what is the history of transactions that have ever touched that address? Uh, fetch a specific transaction given its height, uh, given its hash, uh, get the block height, get a specific block header, so if you wanted to download the blockchain, you could do that. Um, fetch transaction index, so given this transaction, where is that in the blockchain? Which block did that appear in? Uh, fetch stealth, so that would search for stealth transactions, because as, as I mentioned earlier, this is actually used by dark wallets, so that's why they included that feature. Uh, broadcast transactions, so if you've got a transaction, you're ready to send it out and say, hey, I'm gonna spend this money, the server can handle the broadcast for you. And you can also subscribe, so if anything happens to this address going forward, please send me a message and let me know that it got updated. So that's basically what kind of stuff the server can do for you. Um, now, assuming you don't want to be on the server, you don't want to have a big box with you know, 60 gigs dedicated to downloading the blockchain and running all those indexes and stuff. You just want to have a lightweight client that's running on a phone or, or doing something like that. That's where LibBitcoin Client comes in. Uh, LibBitcoin Client is basically a wrapper around the zero MQ stuff, so you just call the C++ function, it goes off, talks to the server, gets the result, comes back, returns the result. Or it can actually do a callback, so you don't have to be blocking, it can all be asynchronous but it's basically just a C++ wrapper around the, the server. Um, but say you don't want to use C++ because C++ is a weird language and nobody likes using it these days. If you're into Python, there's a project called dark wallet slash Python obelisk. It's got that old name in it, but it still does the right thing with the new server. Um, that's if you want to use libbitcoin server from Python. It's basically the same idea as libbitcoin client, but Pythonized. And then we also have dark wallet gateway. And what this does, it's a bridge where it has the libbitcoin server on one side and has a WebSocket on the other side. So if you want to do this thing over WebSockets and talk to your JavaScript in the client, you can do that too if you just run this gateway on your server. So there's lots of different ways to talk to the server if you need to do that. And then libbitcoin explorer is um, the final piece we'll talk about. This is the command line tool, the command line interface to the whole system. Uh, it's called BX, so that we don't have to type this long string every time you want to run a command. BX is very easy to type. But there was an earlier project called SX. Um, SX was the same thing as BX, basically it was a command line interface to the blockchain. Unfortunately, each command was written sort of standalone, and there was no coherency or system to it. Some were written in Python, some were written in C++, and it was a big mess. So what they did is they took all those commands, gathered them together, put them in a standard format, and said, here, this is a new project is called BX, and it's, it's basically the replacement for SX. It's kind of grew out of the seeds of that project. Um, so what kinds of things can this do? Uh, so if you want to do server stuff, you want to fetch the balance, fetch, fetch a block header, fetch the height of a block, get the history of a transaction, all that stuff is available from the command line. Uh, wallet stuff like creating a transaction, signing the inputs, broadcasting it to the P2P network, um, all that stuff is available as well. We've got We've got a hierarchical deterministic key generation, so if you want to generate you know, keys from a seed, we've got you know, the ability to do all that stuff. Elliptic curve math, if you want to do elliptic curve math on the command line, we've got the whole suite of stuff, addition, subtraction, uh, encoding, and decoding, all that sort of stuff. Uh, hashes, uh, all the hashes you could need. Um, uh, format conversions, so base 58, base 64, uh, the address format, uh, the wallet import format, all that stuff. There's tons more that I didn't even go into, but there's, there's probably a good, uh, I think there's about 98 functions inside BX right now. So there's a lot of good functionality in there if you just want to do some stuff from the command line and do Bitcoin stuff. Uh, the good news is that BX is actually fairly easy to get a hold of these days. You just have to go to this one link and download it. It's a single binary, just download on your Linux box and it just runs, or your Mac box, or your Windows box. If you don't trust binaries you downloaded off the internet, <laughs> then I, you can compile it yourself, and there's, there's the code right on GitHub. <laughs> uh, there is an install.sh, and so you just run that one command on a Linux box, and it should just go ahead, fetch all the dependencies, download them, install them, and then build the whole thing, and it should just, you just run it, and half hour later, maybe two hours later, I don't know, it depends on how fast your computer is, you'll have a working copy of BX. Um, or there's manual build instructions if you want to do it all by hand because you're crazy. Or you're a developer. If you're developing on BX, you're probably going to do it by hand because you want to have a nice setup so you're just, you know, you're in the flow. Um, 
Of course, in order to use BX, you need a server, a libbitcoin server. And where can you get those? Um, unfortunately, we don't have an easy just download this binary and run it for that like we do for BX. The source code's there. You can run the install sh, and that will do that same thing. And then once you've got it on your box, you can call init chain and then call Bitcoin server. And then that'll sit there for 20 hours syncing the blockchain, and then you'll have a server up and running. But of course, that's a lot of work. So um, you can just use an existing server. There are plenty of those available. There's a list right there on the, the unsystem wiki. Um, and if you want to just use one, there's one built by default into BX, and that's an Airbit server. And if you want to use it, feel free. No, no questions asked. It's available for everyone to use. But if you do install your own server at some point in the future, um, Airbits would appreciate it if you would allow us to use it as well, because that way we have, you know, you, you use ours, we use yours, and the net network becomes more and more decentralized as we spread the, the server around, spread the load around. Um, but, oh, by the way, all these slides are available on SlideShare, so when, when we're done, there'll be a link, so you can go ahead and download. So don't worry about all these links that are flying by, because they're available for you afterwards. Um, Lib Bitcoin, there is an install sh, but you're basically going to have to compile it yourself. There is no other way, because it is a library, and, and it needs to be compiled for your specific system, your specific version of libc. So here's the example code I promised. We'll just go ahead and run through this. This is a, a fairly simple app, and what it does is you type in, it's basically a brain wallet generator. Everyone's seen these before. You type in a one word or a couple of words. It, SHA-256 is them, and then gives you a Bitcoin address and a private key and all the standard stuff. Just to kind of give you a sense of what it looks like to use some lib Bitcoin code in C++. So let's go ahead and go to the first, first line of this program. Um, it's a single header include. Just include this header. You've got all the Bitcoin stuff. Just that easy. Um, so we're going to grab some text off the console, standard CN. You think that this is a standard C++ thing. It should take a standard string, but instead it takes a char. I don't understand, but it takes a char pointer. So now we've got this array of chars that represent whatever the user typed in. Now we need to convert that to some raw data. The Bitcoin has this concept called a data chunk or a data slice, which is basically just a raw block of bytes, which we use for all kinds of stuff. Transactions are represented as data chunks. Um, blocks are represented as data chunks. Scripts are represented as data chunks. So we need to take that text and just convert it to a data chunk. So really, we just take the beginning and the end of the text, pass it into the constructor, and now we've got a data chunk on our hands. Now we can do something with it. We'll go ahead and SHA-256 it. And that gives us a hash digest. And we'll go ahead and encode that in base 16 and show it to the user. And then we'll go ahead and um, convert that same data to a wallet import format. So that's the, the format you're used to seeing if you ever export a private key and put it on a paper wallet or something. Um, and then here's the final piece of the example. So we'll generate a payment address uh, structure. And then we'll, now a payment address, as you know, is the Bitcoin private seed converted to a public key and then hashed. So we have to do those three steps in order to actually accomplish an address. So the first step down here is secret to public key. That's actually an EC math function that's taking that point and multiplying it by G to form, find the XY coordinates. So that's an elliptic curve function. And we'll take the result of that elliptic curve function, we'll hash it, and then we'll set that as the public key hash for the payment address. And then we can output that to the console, and we're done. Um, so in order to compile something like this, you need a make file. I'm assuming you're on Linux uh, or Mac. There's a nice tool on these platforms called package config, and libbitcoin integrates with that very nicely. So the package config will get you all the C flags that you need. So in this case, it would be standard C++11 and uh, I think the include directory where the library is installed. And then this package config will also give you the libraries that you need to link because libbitcoin pulls in a bunch of stuff. Its dependency stack is fairly shallow compared to the way it used to be, but it still needs a number of things. It needs all the zero and Q stuff, and it needs, um, it needs libsecp256k1, which is the new elliptic curve library that the Bitcoin project recently put out. So we're actually using that for our elliptic curve math. So between those two, you have quite a few packages you have to bring in. So that package config will just dump that list out and it'll just automatically, you don't have to worry about it. 
and then just pass those flags to the compiler and the linker, and you're good to go. Um, so that's pretty much where things stand right now. We do have plans for the future. Uh, we want to do a new protocol for the, the server to client. Now, the protocol we have right now is fairly rigid. It has certain things like I want to get transactions for an address, or I want to get the block header, or some stuff like that. What we want to do is we actually want to back off and say, we want to have a generic query language. So I want to say, give me all the transactions that touch this address and are between this height and that height, and have these flags set, or whatever. You can come up with different query limiters, right? So I want to say this, this parameter, and this parameter, and this parameter, and they all or together, and whatever transactions fit that filter that you've built up, those are the ones you're going to get, or whatever block headers and so forth. So it'll be much more flexible going forward, but that's a kind of a project for another day. Um, right now, we've kind of started on that. It lives in the libbitcoin protocol project, but it's not really complete yet. And the other thing that we want to do as part of this new protocol is uh, prefix queries. So normally when you ask for an address from the server, you give it the whole address. Well, someone who's man in the middling that or snooping your traffic can actually see what addresses you're asking for and that could compromise your privacy. So the idea going forward is, why don't we just give the first four bytes of the address? Now you might hit some addresses that don't belong to you. If I'm asking for a specific address and I only give the first four bytes, there's going to be a lot of false positives. But I, the client, can filter that out myself or make that decision about how much false positives I'm willing to take in exchange for how much privacy I'm willing to get. So that's something I'm not sure anybody else is really doing that we're going to be putting into that new protocol. Um, right now, the protocol is encrypted, so you can turn on uh, zero MQ encryption and it won't, people won't be able to spy on what you're saying. But then again, you also have to trust the server not to be spying on you as well. And the other thing we want to do is we want to not have to trust the server. Because if I ask the server, what are all the transactions for this address, as a client who doesn't have the blockchain, I have no way of knowing that what it told me was in fact correct. So what we want to do is uh, enhance as part of this new protocol the ability to download all the block headers very rapidly. So I want all the block headers from zero to 300,000. It'll just give that to you in a single one megabyte package. And then you can do SPV on the client, verify what the server is saying, check the hash the hashes on all the block headers, make sure the miners actually mine them, and then you have a way to trust what it's telling you. Um, so that's another thing we want to put in so that we don't have to trust the servers we're connecting to. Just you know the data is good because it checks out, you know, it's self, self reinforcing. Um, so these slides are available from here. So if you want to write down that one address, then you've got all the other addresses and all the other notes. All right. Thank you very much. Any questions? <clears throat> yes? Uh, uh, last year, I open sourced a Node.js client for, for, before you were rebranded for Obelisk. And so I had to spend a lot of time actually working and running uh, the server. And one problem, well, not necessarily the current problem, but going to the future, it's monolithic in the sense that it stores all data on one node. And as an infrastructure piece, you do want to Given that it stores a lot of indexes, I think we're like two and a half times the Bitcoin D, which does not store indexes. So back back then, blocking was like 20 gig, and Obelisk was 50, and uh, it's much bigger now. Right. So uh, do you have any plan or any support for multi-node uh, database? We don't have any plans or support for that. What what Airbits has been doing right now? We actually run five separate nodes, and they've all got 200 gig SSDs on them. And the blockchain right now in libbitcoin is about 80 to 90 gigs. So there's plenty of room on those servers. And we have five servers. So they're all redundancy across that way. But of course, now we're storing the blockchain five times. So I don't think it's going to be a problem for another couple of years. And, and you know, terabyte hard drives are available now. And so it won't be you know, for a while before this becomes a serious issue, I don't think. But yes, I agree that, that storing the entire blockchain is going to be an issue going forward. We might have to come up with some sort of pruning as well, too. Yeah. So what's the discovery mechanism in the client? So you mentioned if one, one of the servers goes offline, for example, uh, does it, can, can the client automatically discover new servers, or do you have to do that manually? Right. So unfortunately, it's manual right now. We actually have a list of servers that we, we, have, we, we maintain. We know that these following six servers are online and ready to go. 
and the client downloads that list periodically and then tries them. And if it, any of them are down, it just says, I'll skip that one and just keep trying other ones. Right. So basically, if that list that's on the wiki, you just you know, put in the client. Right. Uh, which is exactly to prevent the kind of thing that might happen if you have low correlation high level implementations. So what do you have to say about that? Right. So there, there has been a, I'm not going to say flame war because it was very polite, but there was, there was a long discussion on the Lib Bitcoin mailing list about what to do about Lib consensus. And half the people were saying, well, no, we want to maintain a separate copy of everything because we don't want to give that, that control away. The other group was saying, well, look, consensus isn't that big of a deal, and it has to be exactly the same between everybody anyway, so why not just use it? So there is that debate going on internally. And I, I think what it comes down to is manpower. No one's implemented lib consensus into lib Bitcoin yet. And until that happens, it's just you know, talk until, you know, until we have some concrete code. That, you know, and then we can say we will or will not accept this code. And I would expect that that code would be accepted, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Any other questions? Hmm? Yeah, on the, the privacy thing with the first bytes, why not just use bloom filters or is it? Right, so here's the thing about a bloom filter. A bloom filter is basically, I have a whole bunch of stuff and if it matches the bloom filter, then it's probably true. And if it doesn't match the bloom filter, it's definitely not true. Or maybe it's the other way around. But in any case, it's sort of a complicated data structure where you actually have to take the bits and then check them in ran random places. It's very difficult to index a bloom filter you'd have to basically check every single transaction in your database and say, does this match the balloon filter? Nope, okay. Does this one match the balloon filter? Nope. And you've got millions or billions of transactions, you can't do that. Whereas a prefix is very easy to look up because you just maintain a try, a uh, TRIE data structure, and then you just, boop, 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 boop. oh, there it is, or no, it's not there. So it's much easier to index against a, a prefix than it is against a balloon filter. Any other questions? <laughs> All right. Are the, the Bitcoin nodes fully compatible with Bitcoin Core? Like the regular Core node wouldn't know what's talking to the Bitcoin? Theoretically. Theoretically. Um, we, we recently discovered a bug where it doesn't properly connect to later versions of the Bitcoin Core. It only connects to older versions. We've got to figure out what changed and why it broke. Uh, there seems to be something wrong in the handshake code. I'm sure it's just like a one line, just stupid little bug, but we do have a bug right now that prevents that from working at this exact moment. But we're working on it. We're, you know, the idea is that it should be identical to a Bitcoin node so that other than the version string, it just works the same. So, um, so how does it communicate with the Python client, for example? So it's 0MQ. There is a library called Python 0MQ. So that library basically connects to the 0MQ socket and sends bytes back and forth. And then we have in Python uh, message interpreters that say, okay, this stream of bytes represents the response to the message that I sent earlier, therefore, you know, here's the data that you asked for. So it's sort of a codec that you know, takes my Python function calls, turns them into you know, bytes that get sent over 0MQ, 0MQ sends back the results, we decode those back into Python structures and give them back to your code. So it actually has a 0MQ connection right. available on the right. Uh, so, so it doesn't have any sort of like JSON RPC or anything? No, it's actually 0MQ. 0MQ is an encrypted binary tunnel. So you've got encryption on both ends and it's you know, fairly, fairly fast and lightweight. Okay. Yeah. But it's not really good because JSON 0MQ is great because, or JSON, JSON over WebSockets is great because it can be connected from anything, right? Everybody's got a library to talk to JSON right. WebSockets. So the new protocol we're coming up with will actually have a manifestation that is JSON manifestation that can run over WebSockets. But that's, again, that's a future project. Okay. In the meantime, we have that bridge thing. Well, I mean, how, how far off do you think that is? Um, I would give it six months. Okay. Yeah. We're kind of all kind of busy and it takes a long time to do these sorts of things. Yeah. What type of encryption do you use to encrypt um, your RPQ? Zero MQ is encrypted. The, the keys are how many, and the key management, how do you? Right, so ZeroMQ uses uh, LibSodium for its crypto. So all those algorithms in LibSodium are what it's using. Um, and then the key, basically the server, along with its address, will publish its key. So you know, I go to the, the list of Bitcoin the servers. Public and, key. Right, the public key, right. And then I, my client also has a key. 
And the server can whitelist or blacklist clients based on, our key, based on their key. Right now, our servers will accept a connection from any client, so we don't have to trust the client. The client's just asking for data, right? So we'll just let any client connect, regardless of their key. The client verifies that the server's key matches what it thinks, and therefore we have a good, secure connection. At least one of the sides has to have a known key, otherwise it doesn't work. So we just publish the key along with the list of servers. Yeah, that was not a, I'm not going to say that that's a great example, right? Because brain wallet technology, you know, that uses just a SHA-256 is not necessarily a good uh, secure way of doing Bitcoin. But, you know, it is just, just an example to show some math happen and some, some you know, use of the library. So there is no, uh, can, you, can you say something, where are those uh, private keys being kept? I mean, so, how are they secured? Right, so if you're building a wallet using LibBitcoin, that's what you have to maintain, is you have to build the whatever strategy it is for managing the keys, right? We just give you the tools needed to build the keys and, man and do whatever you need to do with them, but the actual storage of the keys and the policies surrounding that is what you as a client of the library would have to implement. Right? We're just a toolkit for you know, the basic math and stuff. Uh, how many uh, full, full Bitcoin servers are there right now clients um, to? Somewhere between six and eight, depending which ones are up at any given point in time. And different application clients that connect to any one of them. Yeah, they're all they're all equivalent to each other, theoretically. <laughs> you, um, do you do entropy generation, or do you depend on this one? Uh, our library does not contain any entropy generation code. No, because that's something you have to get from the operating system. And since every operating system is different, we just like you use OpenSSL or something, right? Or do it yourself. Did you say there were only sixty-nine? That's, that's servers that are public, published that you can connect to, like just, you know, anybody can just connect oh, to. Do you have any idea how many nodes there are, what percentage of the network is? No, it's probably not that much higher, though. I mean, I know that there are other people running nodes privately, but I don't know who they are or where they are or how many of them there, there might be. So, uh, so, so do I pitch the Gold Bazaar and Airbits, they can use a, you, they're just sharing those six servers or they use the nodes as well? Um, yeah, so. Right now, I think Open Bazaar is using the Airbit servers. We wish that they would start their own servers, but <laughs> but in the meantime, we're happy to let them use ours. Yeah. Are there any different face notifications where you could listen to say everything happening to their address? Right. Yeah, that's what the subscribe message was about. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. What's the best way to support this? Um, the, the easiest way to support this project is if you've got a spare server, start a node, right? And then let other people connect to it. Uh, the second easiest way would be to make use of it, right? I mean, we've got all this great tech just sitting here ready for you to use. If you've got a project or some experimental weekend stuff, just grab on and see if you can make use of it. And the best way, of course, is to become a developer and contribute code or bug fixes or anything like that. Those are always welcome. But uh, of course, that's, you know, each one of those is a progressively higher barrier to entry. Donations? Donations? I do believe there's a donation address, but I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, so, you had, you had like three different ports uh, to describe the API. You had like, probably zero and two limitation, right? You had request response, publish, subscribe, and a heartbeat. Okay, so the heartbeat's gone. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's just, uh, now it's just a request response and then publish, subscribe. And I don't think there's any real reason to have all those separate things. I think it was just the way he decided to do it because each one of those is optional, right? It's like if I could decide I don't want my server to support subscription, I could disable that in the config file, so that's just one port we turn off as opposed to having, you know. No, it's also the power zero and two binds. You have to decide which socket you which port. Right, but we could, run, we could run the entire protocol over a single port. Like we could run it over a single socket, just multiplex the messages, but we chose not to. And that was a decision that was made a long time ago, so I'm not quite sure why it was done that way. Okay. Any more questions, guys? <laughs> um, I mean, maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, Open Bazaar and how Open Bazaar used the Bitcoin or how the Bitcoin came out of that. Uh, right, so the Bitcoin existed beforehand. And because it was Amir Takai who started Open Bazaar, you know, in its earlier incarnation called Dark Market, um, it made sense for him to use his own technology that he'd spent the last two years building. 
And basically, you have the, the same problem that I showed in that very first slide, where you've got some sort of an API provider giving you access to the blockchain, because you don't want to run a Satoshi client, because um, it has no indexes, it has no way to query these particular addresses, or you've got to download the whole blockchain. Like, that would be a very heavy weight if you expected every OpenBazaar user to run their own node. So the idea was we'd run these nodes in the cloud, and then these clients could anonymously connect to them, fetch the information from the blockchain, do whatever they need to do locally, and, you know, conduct their transactions in secret, just asking from data from time to time. So that's the architecture that's going on there. Yeah, but you have to have some trust, right, in the, 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 the yeah. servers can see the, right. the keys, right? Right, the, the servers, that's why we're adding this new stuff, right, in the new protocol is A, to, you know, just the prefixes, so you don't, you have plausible deniability. Well, that wasn't my address, officer, you know? I was asking for a whole bunch of addresses. It was that, or, you know, who knows which one? And then uh, it's encrypted. And then, of course, you've got SPV coming in. So once you have SPV, you don't have to trust the server. You can check, check the block headers yourself, and then you don't have to worry about it. So we're putting those things in to improve the situation for that particular scenario. Uh, 